Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Wednesday of the month, and it is time for the debut of a brand new show on Chef AJ Live. I am so excited because this is one of the most preeminent cardiologists. He's a plant-based cardiologist from Houston, and he is starting a brand new show today called The Healing Power of Integrative Medicine. Today, we're going to talk about how you can heal things like your heart, your kidneys, your liver. Please welcome to the show. And ladies, He's single, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. It is so nice to see you. I love your name, Baxter. I don't know why I love that name, but especially since I heard the story of how you got the name from your father, I just, I, I, you're the only Baxter I've ever met and it's, uh, you're very unforgettable and it's so great to see you again. I've known you for so long and I'm so happy that when I sent out the email to, to, to pretty much everybody, you, you, you came and wanted to be a regular. I'm so honored. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Well, thank you very much. And it's certainly an honor to be here with you, Chef AJ. And, and as you said, we've uh, known each other for a while and I've enjoyed uh, the uh, relationship and uh, the uh, work we've done together. And I, I look forward to our continued work here on your wonderful show. Well, that's so, what have you been up to? Because it's been quite a while. Yeah, it has been. You know, things uh, are constantly evolving in, in our little corner of the planet. And at Montgomery Heart and Wellness, as you're aware, we've, you know, taken plant-based nutrition and we've applied it in the clinical setting. So, you know, when I was introduced to plant-based nutrition, I was a very busy cardiologist. I was doing the routine things, you know, seeing very sick patients in emergency rooms in my clinic, uh, doing advanced uh, heart failure procedures, uh, electric procedures, et cetera. And so, of course, my health started to deteriorate, and then, and then I started doing my own research, came across nutrition, and particularly plant-based nutrition. And so I entered this uh, space uh, with a 20, a 33-day juice feast detox and felt amazing. And so uh, a local guy here mentored me, and I started getting into raw plant-based foods and plant foods, and I started applying to patients, and one thing led to another. Uh, what really struck me was how powerful nutrition was in not only just preventing disease. There's one thing to say, well, you know, my cholesterol is a little high, my blood pressure is a little high. But what I saw is patients who had already had quadruple bypass, already had multiple stents, the hearts were beating at 10%, the kidneys were uh, in bad shape, the liver was in bad, and we would put them on an aggressive nutrition and a nutritional intervention. And we saw them turn around in relatively short order. Now, over the time, we, as we became known with what we did, you know, more challenging patients came and we started adding you know, different approaches. And so what that has culminated into this approach we use now, and I'd like to say that we are in the process of, to answer your question more directly, what are we up to? We're in the process of redefining the practice of medicine. And we use what I describe as a nutritional, integrative, regenerative, therapeutic approach for our patients who come, for those who are willing to take that approach. And so uh, what I'll be sharing with you and your wonderful audience is exactly what that means, exactly what do we do with a patient. It's one thing to say, well, someone who wants to just feel better, improve their cholesterol, et cetera, how do they do it? But what do you do with the, the patient who's very sick, who's in the hospital, the patient has advanced congestive heart failure, the patient's on the throes of needing surgery, et cetera. How do you manage that patient? How do you apply nutrition and these other therapies? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And what we uh, plan to do is to bring you in to the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center and share with you the approach that we take with different patients and, and the like. That is so amazing. When you said how you approach these patients, I noticed there was a dartboard behind you and I thought maybe that was for the non-compliant ones. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, that's how I relieve my stress from time to time. But uh... <laughs> that's good. you have the best laugh in the world. Are you any good? Because I have gotten bullseyes before. Are you good at darts? Yeah, when I'm close enough, I can hit whatever I need. 
<laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's such a shame because, you know, I watched that wonderful documentary series you did. And it's such a shame that so many of the patients that came to you came when they were already so sick. And that if we could get this knowledge to them, they may not have to get to the point where they're seeing you in the hospital, where they've had a cardiac event, you know? Yeah. You know, there's so many competing forces, as you know, I mean, we're dealing with food addictions. We're dealing with you know, the politics of, you know, the food industry and the medical industrial complex, and which is a very complex topic in and of itself. And so uh, many people are left being confused. Uh, they're left to, you know, to their own pleasures and desires. And, and, and so it's not until they, you know, get very ill that they have the incentive to do something different. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Is it ever too late for heart disease? You know, that's a great question. Um, my answer to that question is, in my experience, we've seen people turn around at virtually every stage. Um, it's only once you're six feet under that we've not seen anybody turn around from that. But from the standpoint of if you're awake and alert enough to talk and walk, uh, and even some people who are very sick and can't walk very well, We've seen them turn around. Now, obviously, once you get to that point, there's a slippery slope. <clears throat> and so, you know, the odds of turning around is less than early on. However, uh, we've seen individuals have remarkable changes. And the individual we're going to share with you today uh, is one such individual who had such bad heart failure. Uh, he started to have kidney failure and liver failure because when the heart starts to fail, circulation gets impaired and the impaired circulation causes other organs to fail. And so you start to see that, you know, you're on that slippery slope and you have to be very aggressive. And so um, what I'd like to do with the audience and share. So on our YouTube channel, we have a, we, a series called clinical rounds. And what I'd like to do is share with your audience at clinical rounds. Uh, and, and we talk about exactly what we do. And then, after that, I think it's like about five or 10 minutes. And then I'd like to then give the background some more insight in terms of what we did, what happened with this individual in the course of action. Then I'd like to open the floor for questions. Great. Do you want me to play the video now? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let me just pull it up here. A couple of different buttons to push. Got that one. Got that one. Hopefully you can see that now, Dr. Montgomery, correct? Yes, I can see that. So let me turn the volume on. Let me start you back here. In terms of heart failure, potential lethal diagnosis on its own. However, what is this covered by early liver failure and kidney failure? We're going to discuss a patient that we care for with just these problems. <laughs> Welcome again to Montgomery Heart and Wellness for another session of Clinical Rounds. Mel and I are going to be here discussing a patient who had congestive heart failure, but also liver failure and renal failure. We all know that congestive heart failure is a potentially lethal disease. Can you just sort of share with the audience how he presented to us and some of the challenges we have to deal with? So he was a 46 year old man who has advanced heart failure, which had caused secondary liver failure and also had fluctuated between stage three chronic kidney disease and a few other stages. He had atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure, diabetes, and was on insulin. He had really low energy. He presented, he was fluid open, I guess we say. He had just gotten out of the hospital, I think, two days prior. So this is a man who had been in and out of the hospital every two weeks, having to get IV diabetics. Prior to coming here, he had to be started on an intravenous diuretic a very complex patient. One thing I'm going to outline, and we'll go into too many details, is that heart failure, one of the ways that people die is what's called pump failure. So you can have multi-organ failure when the heart starts to fail. So then the kidney starts to fail, the liver starts to fail, and you have these conditions with heart failure. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York just issued a... Did Was that it, Dr. Montgomery? Uh, that's just an ad from the YouTube link. You can actually. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, access from that. Wow. Yeah, just hit the. Uh, there we go. Yeah. You know that gout is an inflammatory condition. Inflammation underscores 
pretty much every chronic illness. So he was dealing with his gout. And I think that this was probably the driving force. At least we have to decide what was the driving force or not. So what was our first approach? What do we do with this patient? Just full of fresh juices, vegetables, and fruits only. That was, those nutrients would be absorbed better for him because he had a lot of maledema, which is seen in heart failure and liver failure. We, because of that, we had to stop the insulin because you can't have somebody becoming hypoglycemic that can kill somebody really quickly. Um, his blood sugar stood absolutely fine and great with insulin. We did a lot of the diagnostic testing and we found some other things that were helpful. He was on how many beds? About eight or nine? Or... So, total, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. He, and he wasn't taking all of them consistently, which is a problem you see with patients on a lot of medications. So, it makes it very confusing to determine you know, what's working and what's not because they're not taking them all the time. They're causing side effects of life. He's short of breath. He's in the clinic. And he's, you know, teetering on having to go to the emergency room. And here at our center, you know, we treat patients in this fashion. We gave them a fairly large dose of diabetics. We did his blood work. And, and of course, as you mentioned, importantly, we put on a raw detox. And lots of people don't realize how important that is. So taking off good foods, even off solid foods, can help reduce inflammation. So this problem turned around quite quickly. We started on some specialized anti-inflammatory nutrients, ribosomal curcumin and others. So our approach for him is to immediately attack the underlying inflammatory condition. He came for infrared sauna. He had the ozone therapy immunity. And here's with patients like this, this is where nutritional, integrative, and regenerative care come together. Patients with these advanced illnesses, they benefit from this exact approach. When you start with nutrition, it's the foundation. And so this started working with Lox on the curtain, started to show off information. All of the food started to show off information. All of the other ones started to show off information. So we were hitting him in different directions, and we had a major synergistic effect on his inflammatory condition. It was like, you know, spraying or a major water hole on his condition. We were essentially treating him almost like an inpatient yeah. with daily labs, daily IV diuretics, and so he started to turn the corner. But we noticed something within maybe what, four, three to four, maybe, that he started turning the corner. Yeah. He was having lots of pain from the gout and had a hard time turning his neck. The next step was to evaluate his heart rhythm. And he was in atrial fibrillation. Now, what is the problem with atrial fibrillation and heart failure? So when the heart is beating irregularly, which is what atrial fibrillation is, then that can actually contribute to the reduced cardiac output. You don't get all that blood going into the left ventricle. Over time, that can lead to an enlarged heart, a weaker heart. And that's exactly what he had. His heart was pumping at 11%. And so we need to correct the rhythm, make it regular with the hope to improve forward flow from the heart, and then that can improve other organ function as well. But the sick of the heart is you need all four chambers functioning normally. And he was under the fibrillation, the other chambers are not functioning normally, the lower chamber is just doing the best. So he was functioning at less than half the cardiac capacity. So we have to work to give him an fibrillation. So what we did, again, here's the integrated parts. We have to put some allopathic medicine in it too. We put a low dose amiodarone. And we scheduled them for an outpatient cardioverter. And we did what's called a transesophageal echo. It's an ultrasound probe that's passed through the back of the heart. We look for blood clots. If we don't see the blood clots, we then shock the heart into rhythm. Continue with the detox, continue with the integrated ventricular therapy, et cetera. Over time, with his heart beating in a normal sinus rhythm, he saw some amazing changes. Now, this is normal rhythm with continued blood detox with the other supplements, with ozone therapy. Well, from a symptom standpoint, he was walking faster, moving around. He had comes in a better mood, not having all the fluid retention. On his echocardiogram, the injection fraction was now working closer to 30 percent, which is a huge increase. And markers of liver dysfunction went down by nearly 50 percent. Um, so that was amazing. Yes, yes. So, and as we said at the beginning, the inflammation, the seed inflammatory markers go down was a good sign that the overall underlying inflammation has gone down. The hemodynamics got better because he was in a normal rhythm. So the heart circulation was more efficient. Pressure on the heart went down. So that's a sign that less congestion on the liver and there was better flow to the kidney. So there was evidence of the kidney better. So this gentleman who came to us, he flew in Houston from somewhere in Southern California. And he only had four weeks to help get him turned around. As we followed him remotely with return visits to the clinic, I think he has a good chance to make a very, very meaningful recovery. Any final thoughts for the audience? Yeah, I mean, I think overall, this is a great example of the integrative approach. You know, we really, that's what we do is to spread the word that people can get better. And it's doing so much better. Great. Always a great story to hear. 
Thanks for watching. If you got value out of this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification button to see our next show. Nice. Are you an RN? Okay. Very nice. Yeah, so, you always have such good music in your shows. Well, thanks for sharing that. So I wanted to give your audience a clip of, of how we um, address, you know, these patients and, and a little bit of what we do in the show. And what I'd like to do, and I'll probably share a few slides, just to give you a little bit of background um, about this uh, patient. And, 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 and before I do that, just to share uh, our overall approach, we get patients from, um, you know, East Coast, West Coast, the United States, we get international patients who, you know, hear about our program. And our approach oftentimes is where we're dealing with someone who's from far away. This gentleman, I think, was from the West Coast somewhere. Uh, and patients will come in and they'll only have, say, four to six weeks. Uh, and because we have such a short period of time, we have a number of treatment protocols, as I refer to them as, as a loading treatment protocol. So we'll not only put them on a raw detox diet, but we'll uh, use some of the other modalities which I think is also beneficial to help accelerate their improvement in such a short period of time so that by the time they go back, uh, we've been able to re reduce a number of medications and get them, like in the case of this gentleman, uh, uh, functioning at a higher level. He was had more energy, he was able to walk um, farther. Uh, his ejection fraction, a pumping function of the heart was much better. And so this approach, this you know upfront loading approach is what we use because we have patients who come from far away and they have a limited period of time for us to get them turned around uh, uh, fairly quickly. The other benefit of having someone turn around fairly quickly is that uh, you know, the faster the turnaround, uh, the, the, the better the, the proof of the concept is, and it helps them stick with the program much longer. You know, if he had very slow incremental improvements, you know, even if they were local and were coming to see us, it may be hard for someone to stick with the program if they're not seeing results fairly soon. And so that's where we like the nutritional detox approach that we take, the raw detox. It gives you faster uh, turnaround. Oftentimes, individuals like to make lifestyle changes, and they say, well, uh, I'll make a change, uh, and I'll do it in moderation. I'll cut back here, I'll cut back there. I'll, I'll have a plant-based uh, Monday or, you know, whatever the case is. And, you know, these things are well-meaning, but uh, if you're truly ill and you truly need changes, which most people we see do, you have to make definitive changes and they have to be, you know, when I say definitive, you know, very, very, you know, uh, uh, precise as I like that. I don't like these words like strict. So anyway, let me share. I've got a little PowerPoint. I'm not going to bore you to death with PowerPoint, but but actually, uh, we, our audience, at least me, loves PowerPoint. I don't think it's boring at all because a lot of times we learn when we can see things. But, you know, this ejection fraction, that's not something we walk around knowing, like, right? Yeah, that's correct. We don't, most people don't know their ejection fractions. But, you know, for the most part, if you're functioning normally and, and you know, you're living a healthy life, you uh, likely have a normal ejection fraction. But it's a simple test called an echocardiogram. It's an ultrasound of the heart. Uh, it's painless. Uh, you can have one done by your cardiologist or somewhere, and it can show you, uh, you know, how well your heart's pumping, how well the valves are working. Uh, and we use this test uh, regularly in our in our center. So let me just start off with this gentleman. As as you remember from the presentation of the video, uh, he was a very young age. That's one thing I want to point out. Uh, and you know, he had multiple health problems. Uh, heart failure, diabetes, high blood pressure, atrium. and the more these you know problems you have, what those things are a sign of is the it's a sign of how systemically broken down your body is. You know, oftentimes, you think of these multiple illnesses as you know multiple problems that are contributing to your overall illness, which I guess that's a reasonable way to approach it uh, because you know atrial fibrillation does make you know heart failure worse and high blood pressure and diabetes work against, you know, with each other to make you sicker. But they also represent the fact that your body systemically is ill. So diabetes is a sign that your metabolic processes are, are off balance. And, and hypertension is a sign that uh, some of your hormonal and vascular system is off balance. And atrial fibrillation is a sign that your 
cardiac electrical circuitry is off balance. So not only do these illnesses contribute to your, illness, to your overall illness, but they are also signs of how sick you are. So this gentleman had multiple ailments and, and he had gout that was so bad that uh, he had these very large, you know, um, inflamed toe fire on his joints. And so it was our thought that it was the underlying inflammation that was really making a lot of this worse. And so we targeted the inflammation. Uh, when he flew down and he arrived at our center, he was ju had just been discharged from a hospital uh, probably um, four or five days prior to coming. And he was just discharged. When he arrived at our place, he was probably about 20, 25 pounds fluid overloaded. So we had to give him IV diuretics in our center. And we were seeing him in our center just about daily. Uh, just to keep him out of the hospital. So we were able to get him diuresis. And again, this is the combination of allopathic medicine with the nutritional part. But we put him on a combination cold press juice smoothie feast. We didn't put him on solids. He was on cold press juices. Um, and the reason we do that frequently is because heart failure patient in particular, but other patients with systemic inflammation, um, they don't absorb the nutrients very well. Uh, and for him, he probably had bowel edema, which meant that his absorptive capacity of his medication and other nutrients was impaired. And so we wanted to nourish him with cold pressed juices and smoothies so he didn't rely on this GI system to break down the nutrients. So we started him on that. It also has a very powerful anti-inflammatory approach. Uh, and we also then started him on liposomal curcumin. As you know, it's an active ingredient. Uh, and turmeric, uh, which has anti-inflammatory properties. And then ozone, intravenous ozone, your audience may or may not be uh, familiar with, uh, but O3 uh, ozone that we use, which is ozone is in the atmosphere, uh, we will take uh, blood from the patient and infuse with ozone. And what that does, it creates a oxidative stress, which causes the body to have a rebound antioxidant antioxidative response. And so it creates an inherent antioxidant process and it, 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 and it, it strengthens the mitochondria, it improves uh, oxygenation at the cellular level. So this along with the nutrition is working at the cellular level to improve his overall uh, physiological and functioning status and also cardiac function. So um, as you know, the echo show this ejection fraction, 10 to 15 percent, normal is 50 to 55 percent. Uh, he uh, only went two and a half minutes uh, on the treadmill. His heart rhythm was uh, 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 impaired. And so this impaired his circulation because his heart wasn't pumping effectively. Uh, and he had such bad heart failure, his liver was congested. So he had liver inflammation. So these are the blood tests. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but this NT proben P is a measure of how bad your heart failure is. So if this number is very high, that means the heart muscle is under stress. Uh, and so in some situations, the higher the number, the worse you are. Now, there are rare situations the number may be higher is better. But for the most part, the higher this number is, the worse you are. Uh, his inflammatory marker, CRP, was elevated. His kidneys were impaired, and he had some liver enzymes that were abnormal. Uh, bilirubin is elevated. And of course, he's a diabetic. And then this uh, molecule here is a sign of abnormal blood vessel function. So the ADMA, um, asymmetric dimethyl uh, arginine, uh, is elevated when you have impaired endothelial function. And so we follow this as well. So as I said, we start him on a juice feast. We start on an ozone therapy, and the goal was to reduce the inflammation because it was our thinking that as we were able to drive down the inflammation, the body could hear. And, and inflammation, I like to think of as a biochemical fire. And so it was a matter of putting out the fire, if you will, and allowing the body to heal. Now, uh, on the allopathic side, in addition to the diuretics, and of course, we had also started weaning a lot of medications. And in a matter of about the first week and a half, maybe two, we had reduced probably five, maybe six medications that he was on, including the insulin. 
However, we did start them on an anti-rhythm medication called amiodarone. If your audience were to look up amiodarone and say, well, gosh, there's a lot of side effects for amiodarone. And yes, it does. But we use it in his situation because we wanted to take him to the hospital and cardiovert him into a normal rhythm because I knew that that's going to help his heart function better. So we started him on the amiodarone. Uh, and even though it's metabolized through the liver and the liver was stressed out, we were doing other things to enhance the liver's function to help the liver recover and give it a, a greater ability to handle the amiodarone. So that's the integrative approach that we took. And it's a very uh, methodical, you know, thought out process. So long story short, we got him into sinus rhythm. And over the course of just really four weeks, uh, we saw his NT pro BNP level go down significantly. Inflammation went down. Uh, GFR, because he had some uh, diuretics that were left on too long, he was a little bit dehydrated. So the GFR went down some, but this was corrected later on when we stopped the diuretics. But his liver function improved. The inflammatory markers of the platelet counts got better. The liver enzymes reduced. His INR, we measured as a, a sign of liver function, that improved. Uh, blood glucose fluctuated, but this is a blood glucose off of insulin. This is on insulin. And the ADMA went down. So it showed some signs of improvement in his endothelial function. Uh, the echocardiogram, which showed the ejection fraction only 10 to 15%, uh, it went up to 30 to 35%, still below normal, but a significant improvement. And the increased pressures on the right side of the heart went down. As I said, NT pro and BMP, he was converted to normal sinus rhythm and some of the leakage in the valves were better. So here's just a graphic show of the improvement, reduced inflammation here, reduced NT pro BNP and a reduced right sided pressure. That's the amount of congestion in the lungs due to the uh, weakness on the left side of the heart. And this shows that to be reduced. And of course the ejection fraction uh, nearly triple uh, on this approach. So again, he was able to walk um, uh, and perform regular daily exercises. Uh, he was less fatigued, his arthritic, arthritic symptoms uh, were heavily suppressed. He was able to have more mobility in his neck and his joints. Uh, so he had, you know, lots of improvement in his symptomatology and he was ready to continue. He was, you know, he had to go back in four weeks, but he was in much better shape on many fewer medications, uh, and also, uh, feeling better and functioning better, uh, after this, uh, intervention. So I just wanted to share this with your audience to give you insight into how we address you know, this particular patient, because in, in most situations, in fact, in his situation, he was recommended for heart transplant. And um, even someone his level illness would have been a challenging patient for even a heart transplant because of all the comorbidities, particularly with the gout and the like. So this approach I felt would be more powerful and more effective than put him on a transplant list. I mean, that's amazing, really. You know, you your approach with starting with, with raw or high raw, because you, you have the different stages. Why is that more healing than just giving somebody a vegan diet or even a whole food plant-based diet with, with cooked food? What is so special about that? Because we know that Dr. Brooke Goldner, who has a regular show on my channel, also is really a fan of just the hyper-nourishment with the, with the greens and the, and the rawness. So what is special about that? So we know, and there was... Um... Uh, data. One, there's not a lot of uh, studies done uh, comparing raw to cooked. However, the little we need to know, there's a, a Dr. Jenkins um, in his reference in one of our papers who, um, and, and, and to my knowledge, his study was the only one that showed a raw diet, you know, head to head with a cooked plant diet. And uh, he also had a, a, an arm of someone doing regular foods. He had raw, plant-based, cooked plant-based, and then uh, a control group. And he showed hand down, hands down much faster uh, uh, improvement uh, with the raw diet compared to the, the, the plant-based diet. Uh, if you look at our data, when we looked at uh, individuals with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and obesity, and our published data showed uh, 
a reduction in, in um, um, C-reactive protein by 30% in four weeks. Of course, a reduction in blood pressure, cholesterol, and the like. Uh, and also, we were the first to show uh, a reduction in LP level A uh, by about 16% uh, in four weeks. Now, um, Dr. Kim Williams and Dr. Terry Mason, uh, they did a similar study in a very similar population. Now, again, it's not head-to-head, -head, uh, but they put them on a plant-based diet that was cooked. And so they showed similar findings, but they were less drastic in a slightly longer period of time. So I'm not saying that's a head-to-head -head study, but that's the evidence that we have that shows comparison. Now, if you want to say biochemically and physiologically why a raw diet would be better, we do know that when we cook foods, it does change the biochemistry of it. So, uh, and um, I forget the name of this doctor, back in the 1800s showed that eating cooked plant foods increased white blood cells. Uh, and the name will come to me later, maybe another show. Uh, but uh, we do know having cooked foods can uh, have a pro-inflammatory effect depending on how you cook them. So if you go from, you know, boiled or steamed to grilled, heavily grilled, and you got the grill marks or, uh, um, you know, we don't allow our patients to microwave their foods even when they get back on cooked foods. So we emphasize steel, uh, steamed and boiled. Uh, cooked foods, you know, soups and the like. Uh, but of course, we all know fried foods are bad. Uh, so to the extent that these foods are heavily cooked and overcooked, we know they lose their nutritional value. But even the early phase of cooking foods, uh, you have to think of the food as a three-dimensional, uh, you have to think of the three-dimensional architecture of food. So, you know, like if, if, a, if a molecule, a nutrient is shaped like this, and when you change the temperature rapidly and it goes shaped like that, then the body's going to recognize something different. This versus this, it may be the same components in terms of the components that it has, but this is much different. A good analogy would be if you have a chair that's made of wood, and then you take that chair and maybe you, you know, grind it into sawdust and put a pile of sawdust, the same amount of wood is there, but it's not the same chair. It's not the same usability. And so when you put something with heavy heat, uh, it tends to melt it or change the architecture of it to where the body may not recognize it as well. So would you say that for reversing a disease, the diet needs to be more stringent than just for like your average person that just wants to be healthy and stay healthy? Yeah, that's exactly right. And the thing is that, it, you know, the, 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 the sicker our patients are, the more precise and stringent our diets are until they get to a point of recovery. Then we let them introduce cooked foods, but obviously nothing fried or, or you know, overly cooked and processed foods and the things that you like. Again, processed foods. I mean, foods that are technically raw, you know, that fall under the classification of raw, may be overly processed. You know, uh, you know, too many nuts or too many. Or some raw foods have oils in them and things like that. So we we have a food classification system that we use to help give a certain level of precision to it, as opposed to using raw versus unraw. Very nice, very nice. Would you like to take questions? I have questions Absolutely. submitted Absolutely. in advance. We always, uh, guys, we always do the ones that are submitted first, just because we can keep track of them. We can email you when they're answered. And then if there's time, we'll go to the chat. So we have the first one, um, because we, we told people we're going to talk about heart, liver, and kidneys. So that might be on any of those topics. And this is from Esther. And she said, what would the protocol be with some for someone who has scored high on the genetic LPA and APOB for heart disease and is already whole food plant-based? And can you work with someone who lives in California? Well, yes, we work with people who live in California. We have a number of programs. Uh, we have online programs that allow people to connect to us. Uh, so you go to MontgomeryHeart.com uh, and you can see, uh, learn about our different programs. Uh, people from other states fly in to see us in the clinical setting. We may work with you for a period of time. You fly back and we can still work with you clinically once we've seen you uh, at least once in our, our setting here in Houston. Uh, the protocol for someone with, say, who's genetically predisposed to ele elevated LP little A would be for anyone else with an elevated LP little A. 
most people elevated LP little a's have, have a genetic predisposition to it. And really, when you think of the genetics, <clears throat> the genetics tells us how, excuse me, the genetics essentially tell us how we break down. For example, uh, I have the genes to be a diabetic, but I don't have diabetes. But if I were to go on a crazy lifestyle, stop exercising, eating processed foods and dead animal flesh and the like, then I would start to express those diabetic genes. And so my mechanism of breaking down would be to develop diabetes. And the same thing for other illnesses. So when you're talking about a lifestyle intervention, you're talking about an environmental, the environmental influence or, or part of the environmental influence. And food is a big environmental influence. It's not the only one, but it's a major one. Other environmental influences are social lives or how much you know outdoors sunshine we get and fresh air and sleep and so on. So there are many environmental inputs into how well we do from a health standpoint. So our protocol for someone with elevated LP level A would be a very aggressive plant-based diet uh, uh, at the lower levels of the food classification system, i.e. raw. Uh, and we would detox them and follow those numbers over time and then make changes uh, uh, as, uh, as the clinical condition uh, justifies. You know, I, you mentioned Dr. Kim Williams, and I love this, the former past president of the American College of Cardiology. And I love his line, there's only two kinds of cardiologists, <laughs> vegan and those who haven't read the data. So we know there's other wonderful plant-based cardiologists, many of whom have been on the show, but are you pretty much the only one practicing in Houston? Um, I'm the only one I know of practicing in Houston. Let me put it this way, because oftentimes... Yeah, you know, there are doctors who are doing plant-based medicine that are showing up all the time and it's hard to keep up, which is a good thing. Uh, but I'm the only one I know of, so I'll, I'll say it that way in case someone discovers someone else someone I don't know, just let me know. <laughs> I'd love to meet them. Nice. Very cool. <clears throat> you know what? One of the things I love about your work, because this next question smacks of, of this as the underlying cause of this person's problem, is that you acknowledge food addiction. Uh, some doctors and some plant-based doctors don't, but here's a question from Laura and it's about her dad. She's desperate. My 85 year old dad began nighttime dialysis two months ago. He hasn't met the one daytime dietitian. His only dietary advice has been eat lots of eggs and chicken and avoid potatoes <laughs> from his nephrologist. His diet has been, and is still the sad diet, including frequent restaurant meals. I've done everything within my power, including cooking for him, having Dr. Esselstyn talk to him in an attempt for him to avoid dialysis, all without success. He's treated to oily, salty restaurant meals on a regular basis by others who mean well and encouraged to eat lots of animal proteins with no focus on nutrient-dense plants. The question is, does the SAD diet, high in salt and animal products, accelerate death and up the risk of heart failure? And does SAD and a lack of fiber put additional strain on the dialysis machine, therefore putting more strain on the patient? I'm afraid his diet is shortening what time he has left. Yeah, I think it's an answer yes to all of the above. It certainly can do those things. And, and you know, the unfortunate mm -hmm. uh, part about it is that uh, I, I can identify with the issue with the um, dietary recommendations of the dialysis centers because I deal with that a fair amount uh, here in Houston. And, and just to give you a little bit of background from my perspective as to why they recommend that. So essentially, if the dialysis centers, they, you know, of course they, you know, they're, they're rated, it's, it's all regulated. So they're rated on the quality of the health of their patients. And so among the different labs that they follow, uh, albumin is one. Now, apparently they have data that shows that the dialysis patient with lower albumin levels. Albumin is one of the major proteins that's measured in the blood. So the dialysis patient, end-stage renal failure patients with lower dialysis do worse than end-stage renal patients, failure patients with normal, or normal albumin. And so, so their thinking is that, well, their albumin is low because they're not eating enough chicken, eggs, and beef and pork or whatever. So they encourage them to eat more of these foods to keep the albumin up. But the problem with that uh, approach is the following. The reason albumin is low, there are many reasons albumin is low. The two major reasons that we see in the clinical setting is one, 
uh, inflammation. So if someone has systemic inflammation, uh, their blood vessels become very leaky and the albumin leaks out of the blood. And so the albumin level goes out. And it's, there's a patient on a clinical channel that we show his albumin improving on a plant-based diet. Uh, and the other reason that albumin may be low is that the liver is not functioning adequately. And so, because the liver, people ask, well, where do you get your protein? Well, you get it from the liver. Uh, and so liver, adequate liver, liver function will result in adequate albumin levels. And so, but they don't use that logic. They use that, we just got to eat more dead animal flesh so you can get the albumin up. And that's really the wrong logic because the more animal flesh you give, the renal failure patients die from cardiovascular disease more than anything else. And so more of this kind of diet you feed them, you're accelerating cardiovascular disease and accelerating their risk of dying. And, and I often like, I often don't negotiate death with patients because we're all going to die. I mean, last time I checked, it's human mortality rates one per person. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really the quality of life. Uh, so, you know, you may, you know, if God came down and said, well, you got another 40 years on this planet, regardless of what your age is. And then you get the option. You can live 40 years in a nursing home with someone, you know, changing your diapers. Or you get 40 years and hurting on tons of medication, pain every day. Or you get the next 40 years, energetic, independent, doing the things you love to do. Well, most people choose the latter. And that's my negotiating leverage point, if you will, or, or, or value proposition toward leading a healthy nutritional life. It's because you want to have the quality of life. That's really the, the key to all this. And so it doesn't matter what disease you have. There are lots of patients with, with heart failure, or this, that, and the other. And we detox them, and maybe the heart still is weak, but they're able to function at a high level without medication, without hospitalizations, et cetera. And same with people with other chronic illnesses. So it's not about the disease label you have, but the high quality of life that you're able to live. Amen. Thank you. All right. So we had a heart. We had a kidney question. <laughs> now we have a liver question. Okay. Oh, what are you drinking, by the way? Because is it coffee? Because I'm going to. No, this is a, uh, I bake uh, hot water with lemon. I put um, first squeeze lemon in hot water. Because what is this? Why are so many of these cardiologists and Dr. Gregor and Dr. Williams so pro coffee? I don't know any doctors that are at least doctors that I see as patients. I was even seeing just my regular doctor who happens to be in Venice and they don't do coffee. And he's saying he just got a patient with, you know, a bladder cancer. Like, I, I don't see how coffee is so recommended because of the what the just because something has benefits, it doesn't mean it doesn't also have risks. Yeah, and that's the that's the big pharma. You can find some little lab that gets better, and then it's like, okay, everything's great about it. I, I'm not an advocate of coffee. Now, you can make an argument from a pure standpoint that, theoretically speaking, coffee should be okay. However, coffee is such a highly commodity, uh, 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 a high commodity that's that's sold. So I think the way we process coffee beans and the like uh, makes it a problem. So, you know, a natural food in its natural state is good, but we also have to look at things that are, that, you know, are sold for profit. And so you get into the process of you change how you uh, procure that, that plant food, then it becomes a problem. So, but no, this isn't coffee. I, don't okay. drink coffee. I drink herbal teas and water and the like. You know what I'm drinking? You, 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 have you ever heard of this expression, pot liquor? No. I mean, I mean, I heard pot liquor, but I mean, yeah, I heard the expression, but. So what it is, is we eat vegetables at first and, and it's part or as part of our breakfast here. And so the liquid that's, the, it's very cold where I live now. I don't live in Southern California anymore. The warm liquid left over from the steaming of the greens. It's basically broth, but it's, it's better than like the cartons that you buy with the salt and just, it's, oh. and it's just, I've been doing that for gosh, 12 years. And it's just, to me, it's just as good as coffee. It's a great way to start your day and it's. Wow. And yeah, I'll have to try that one day. <laughs> it's very good because well, a lot of people throw it out, and you're basically throwing out all the nutrients if you do right, that. Right. If, if, if not, if nothing else, save it, let it cool, and then water your plants with it because the plants love it because it's yep. it's it's like supercharged. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, Anonymous says, what recommendations do you have for a person with cirrhosis? They are currently getting regular ultrasounds and blood works, but not much, not told much else. Cirrhosis here is not alcohol related, but food related. Is there any hope encouragement that you could share with them? Well, the patient I presented had some early cirrhosis. Uh, there's some evidence of that. And we've had a number of patients with cirrhosis and obviously you start with the raw detox diet. Um, some of our integrative approaches, we will use um, an infusion, a molecule called PolyMDA, which has lots of alpha lipoic acid, among other vitamins and minerals. It has uh, uh, acetylcholine, which also detoxes uh, the liver. Uh, intravenous ozone has uh, a, an element of modulating the immune system. Many people have liver cirrhosis in part because of a triggered autoimmune process. And, and you're right, because of the food. Um, this concept of fatty liver uh, is one that's, you know, recently described. And it's actually something that's near and dear to my heart because um, back in 2002, when my mother died, she died of liver cirrhosis. And it was, that, it was this concept of liver cirrhosis due to the standard American diet and polypharmacy, which I learned you know, taking care of her only in retrospect after she died because she was seen in gastroenterology for a long time and there was no reason for her to have advanced liver cirrhosis. It was only the medication she had taken when I looked and said, okay, you know, out of these 10 medications, eight of them are cleared through the liver. Plus the standard American diet, they call it the diabetic diet, but again, processed foods and the like. But at that time, fatty liver wasn't anything that was well described. And that was something that, you know, I learned about and I started using raw detox diet to help people reverse. So you'll start with a raw detox diet uh, first and foremost, and that's a very powerful way. And there are other adjunctive things you can do in addition to that to help that out. Thank you. Okay, guys, now we can go over to the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Also reducing medications. And so even though you may not be their treating doctor, you want to put lots of pressure on doctors to reduce the medication. I cannot say that enough. Uh, reduce medications, reduce medications, reduce medications. And although I'm a cardiologist, I take patients off statins at the blink of an eye, uh, especially if I know they're going to follow a healthy plant-based diet. I just have to leave that in there. Nice, nice. Uh, Meg, who's watching live, hello, Meg, says, low left ejection fraction caused suddenly by a viral infection. Whole food plant-based, low friend. Low friend is whole food plant-based, no oil. Is it possible to have the ejection fraction return to normal? Cardiologist is not plant-based, very frustrating. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to do a whole food plant-based diet to modulate the immune system. So the issue with viral infections is a problem, or not just only viral infections, but infections in general. Uh, when the body is, is, is insulted, if you will, by something foreign, a virus, a bacteria, uh, you know, a, a worm of some type, uh, the immune system is alerted to then you know, defend itself. Now, if you start off with an immune system that's in disarray, and why would an immune system be in disarray? Immune system would be in disarray because of biochemical and physiological imbalance, particularly biochemical imbalances. And these biochemical imbalances, in many cases, start with our poor diet. So we're putting in lots of foods that don't belong to our system. These foods trigger inflammation. They have the immune system revved up on a regular basis. So we measure, you know, C-reactive protein and white blood counts. These white blood counts are in the upper limit of normal. Uh, and CRP is elevated. So you got an immune system that's already revved up because you live in a toxic lifestyle. So then here comes a virus, a bacteria, and insults. So this immune system is already revved up. So then now to be, if you had uh, um, a security service, your armed guards standing out guarding your house, but instead of them being alert and in their right mind, they're on drugs, some on crack, some on alcohol, and they're kind of crazy. Uh, they're sort of revved up. And so when they're alerted to someone invading your house, then instead of them having a controlled, organized attack, because they're in disarray, they'll start shooting the abnormal person or the intruder. But then they'll also start shooting the people that live in the house because they're in such disarray. And so when you start shooting people that live in the house, 
that in that case, that represents the analogy of the autoimmune process. So typically when someone has a viral infection, you have infection, the infection is oftentimes dealt with and, and, and suppressed. But what you're left with, is you're left with an immune system that's attacking self. And frequently different organs can fail. In this case, uh, heart failure would be due to the immune system attacking the heart. Same thing you have with the kidneys and other, the nervous system even. And I've seen patients come in, uh, one patient came in, he couldn't walk. And, and I took a history, he had caught a viral infection. He was at the movies and someone was sneezing and coughing. And the you know, next day or two, he became, started sneezing and coughing, had a flu-like syndrome. Uh, after he recovered from that, then he developed this neuropathy. And so I told him, look, this is an autoimmune process. Uh, and now he was already on a plant-based diet. Uh, he and his wife were plant-based, but I had to put him on a raw detox plant-based diet and that helped reverse that. And uh, we had a number of people with other types of uh, infections with persistent autoimmune process. You have to detox the body. So I think that would be the first application with the person with heart failure. That's right. Like, what about fasting? I'm just curious because if if raw in, in terms of healing is better than cooked, it maybe is nothing better than something? Well, <laughs> well that's right. It's great. It's great that you mentioned that. You know, we all fast to a certain extent. You know, when we're sleeping, uh, if you sleep for eight hours, you're not eating during that time, uh, generally speaking. And so uh, you're fasting. And in fact, the better you sleep, the better you fast. Uh, and oftentimes you notice how some people are eating, you know, really bad food. Uh, uh, for example, you know, you have a very heavy Thanksgiving meal with all the bad stuff. Uh, and then you get sleepy. The body wants to, <laughs> to go to sleep. And sleep does a lot of different things more than we understand. But fasting is one of those things that's in sleep. Uh, and so fasting allows the body to heal itself, uh, the correct abnormal things. And so fasting is important. And some people have to go on prolonged fasting. We do, uh, we utilize a time-restricted eating pattern. People refer to it as intermittent fasting, but we'll have people eat within a four-hour window of time. And we use that as part of our intervention. So you may have, you know, um, a long period of time, 20 hours of fasting with a four-hour feasting period. And we found that to be very helpful. And of course, you're up near True North and they do prolonged water fast and the like, uh, which has been shown to be very, very powerful. Thank you. Well, and uh, Joyce, who's watching live, says, have there been any studies on people who do a raw only diet? And what do you think about eating only raw? So eating only raw uh, is very doable. Uh, I think the difficult part about eating only raw is getting away from the foods we're used to. And so... The individuals who, who prepare gourmet raw foods to help you with that transition. Um, uh, I personally have eaten only raw for like two years, two plus years, and I'll do like extended periods of eating raw, then add some cook. Uh, that people have gone like decades eating only raw. Um, the, the benefit of eating only raw is simply your body just does better with it. And the more raw food you eat on a regular basis, the better you get. So even though you're not 100% raw, if you're eating a lot of raw plant foods, uh, um, that's going to be a great benefit to you. Uh, and so uh, the benefit of the raw diet is that it's just simply, it's easy on the digestive system. It helps reduce inflammation. Uh, and, and it just has a powerful health maintenance uh, effect. And you're getting the the the, the ideal aspects of the nutrients. Now, having said that, uh, we have to be careful in terms of how we procure our food. Uh, now, there are different thoughts on this. Uh, you know, there's organically grown, et cetera. We, we try to encourage people to get sustainably grown uh, produce. Uh, many pro foods are, are genetically engineered. Um, you know, Brian Clement of, of um, Hippocrates thinks that most of not all the fruits genetically engineered and, and there's something to be said about this. And so we have to think about where we get our food from uh, in addition to the fact that it's raw or not raw. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I was raw for a couple of years, over 20 years ago, and I just, I was always cold. And I'm a, I'm so intrigued by the people that are raw. We have a regular show once a month, Lissa and Nate feeling great, and they make the most beautiful food. But it just seems like there's so much work and so much chewing. It, it can be. Now, there's some gourmet raw stuff. Now, our kitchen, we do a high percentage of our food is raw. 
and we brought in some raw chefs in over the years. And what we do, we we in our kitchen, our nutrition center, we like we'll make you know dehydrated breads with seeds and things, uh, and and wraps. And so we make these things available to our our clients and patients, so they don't have to go through the trouble of doing all these long dehydration. And we we have some dehydrated chips and things that have some crunch. So there's some things that we do in the raw uh, uh, realm that help, uh, you know, help our patients and clients um, enjoy the food and that's reminiscent of what they're used to on a regular diet. Yeah. But you, you, I mean, do you still recommend rather low in fat if they're raw? I mean, you don't recommend oils and like a huge amount of fat, do you? So we don't recommend any oils. Um, the fat, so... You know, we, we're not proponents of a 10% fat diet necessarily. Uh, in some situations, that's appropriate. Um, when we did our study and uh, we had a defined plant-based diet, and when we show reduction in cholesterol, reduction in a very rapid period of time, in fact, we were the first to show a reduction in hemoglobin 1C of 3.4% in just four weeks which show that we were reducing the fluctuation of blood sugars. Uh, the, the diet, that particular diet, when we analyzed it, was about 20% fat. So it's not a 50% fat diet, but it, it was 20% fat. So it's not a stringently low fat diet. I think the issue with fats, and what I emphasize to our patients and clients, that you want to make sure all the fats are raw. If you're cooking a fat, and if you're cooking 100% of your food or 95% of your food, then you want to make sure 10% or less is fat because you're cooking a lot of fats. So if you're eating raw fats, I think it'd be better off if you, than eating cooked fat foods. Right. Thank you. And and where do you stand on salt? A little bit? Not a lot? None? Miso? Tamare? Soy sauce? Yeah. You know, salt is in the food. Sea vegetables. Um, other things I think are okay. We're not big advocates of adding salt. Now, having said that, the, as you know, there are different opinions. I can tell by the nature of your question. Mm -hmm. uh, and Joel Farman says, no salt, whether it's from the moon or from the you know, lake or from the wherever. And I think there's some val value in that. The issue with salt is like other things. Most of the bad data on the salt that we have is in, it's in processed foods. So, for example, if somebody says, oh, I eat a hot dog or I eat a whatever, and it's high in salt, or I eat you know, this dressing or whatever, or this you know, chemical sauce, it's high in salt. So we look at the salt, sodium, 900, sodium, such, but there are other also processed ingredients there too that's contributing to the adverse health. So that's one. Two, most of the salt that's used in these preservatives things is a highly processed salt. So oftentimes they'll take a natural sea salt or whatever, they boil it to get the other minerals out. Then they have to bleach it and add anti-caking talc to it. So most of the table salt we get, plus they fortify the iodine, most of the table salt or salt that's in these processed foods are processed salts. So again, you're dealing with a different type of chemical molecule. So I'm not gonna say you should add a lot of salt to your food. I'm just saying that a lot of the adverse health data on salt is on this chemicalized salt. And this already chemicalized salt is a different molecule than a natural salt. I don't think you should have to add, even add sea salt, you should enjoy the natural flavor of the food in its natural state. But having said that, I don't think it's the end of the world if you add a little sea salt to some of your food from time to time. My, 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 my honest answer is that we need more data and more study looking at this. And I think it's gonna come down to a matter of circumstances. If you're somebody with bad hypertension and your vascular system and, uh, and, and hormonal system and damaged by the damaged salt, then you're gonna be less tolerant of salt. Just like the person with, you know, who's morbidly obese and have high cholesterol, et cetera, it's gonna be less tolerant of fats. Uh, but somebody who has lots of seizures, 
and other types of disorders, they may benefit from a higher fat a fat diet and somebody with low sodium, adrenal gland uh, deficiency uh, or autonomic nervous system deficiency, we actually have them add sea salt to the diet. So again, it depends on the circumstances. And the unfortunate thing is that because virtually every one of us has come through this, you know, toxic environment, nobody's biochemically and physiologically optimized. And so we have to do different things to manipulate our diet to in healthy ways to, to improve our overall recovery. I want to respect your time because you're not only a medical doctor, but you're in your scrubs and you're at your office. So, you know, we, we, Dr. McDougall sometimes goes four hours. I don't expect you to do that. So we can stop anytime. One of the questions is if you could show your classification system, but you're going to be coming back every month for yep. 2024. So, yep. so, you know, we can, we can just say goodbye now, if you want. And the people that we didn't get to your questions, please just go to help at chefaj.com. We send you an email on Saturday or Sunday. We tell you what guests you just respond to that. And then we have a service where we write you back when the questions answered. So would you like to do it that way, Dr. Montgomery? There are some so, great questions in the chat, but they can. How many, how many, how many more questions do you have left? Well, I have a few, like, um, let's see, I, you know, I, my chat goes very, very quickly. So sometimes they ask them and they disappear, but I saw, here's one on uh, CHF, a congestive heart failure from Eileen. I'll For take a couple more and then the rest we can handle on the next show. Thank you. For someone with CHF, should they stick to the raw whole foods rather than juice fast due to concerns about liquid limits and fluid buildups due to CHF? Great question, Eileen. That's a great question. I'm not afraid of the juice feast with the uh, heart failure patient. We've actually, we've had heart failure patients that we, they do better on like a smoothie feast or juice feast, especially early on when we're trying to get them out of that uh, severe uh, uh, um, condition. The issue with heart failure isn't so much volume overload necessarily. The patient we presented today, we, he was volume overload, we died recently, but he wasn't volume overload because he was taking in too much fluid per se. He was volume overload because his body had extreme amount of inflammation and with inflammation, your blood vessels leak. So it leaks into the third space of the lung and other parts of the body and the heart's weak. It doesn't circulate. So we put him on a juice feast, even though he was decompensated because we knew that that drove down the inflammation and he got better. So the, the juice and smoothie, we don't worry about the volume there. What we do is we worry about the amount of inflammation. We get to get the inflammation down. Then the body will be able to handle the volume uh, effectively. Mm. Tani says, how long will someone typically live with an ejection fraction of 30%? I'm guessing that's low, right? Yep. That's low. 50, greater than 50 is normal. So 30%, you know, you got about a 40% reduction. So, uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, I've had patients who live a long time with ejection fraction, even lower than that. And, and the, the, the nice thing about it is if they're, if they're following a healthy lifestyle, uh, and doing a lot of the right things, then that may be the, the highest their ejection fraction will go, but they can have a long fruit for life and be very functional even there because the body will compensate in other ways. Thank you. And M asks if you work with patients that have a PD dialysis. Yeah, we have to have patients with uh, PD sense of peritoneal dialysis. And uh, yes, we work with patients with peritoneal dialysis. Nice. And then somebody asked if you could talk about kidney. Sorry, sorry guys. You got to really, it helps me out really when you put the four question marks first, because there's a lot of comments as well. It was about if you could talk about something and I don't see it now. I'm so sorry. Oh, do you take Medicare? Well, that's an easy question. Yes. We take Medicare. So basically what happens, Medicare covers a lot of our traditional treatments. But like this gentleman that came to see us, he had Medicare and a lot of our medical stuff is covered by that. But the integrative things are out of pocket. And so what we do when patients from out of state call, we decide what treatment plan they benefit from and we will outline different approaches and different budgets and our team will work with them. Right. Here it is. Can Dr. Montgomery talk about the me mechanisms he sees in kidney recovery? You know, it's interesting because it's a variety of things. And I'll kid you not, uh, some of the simplest things are the most profound. So 
For example, we see individuals with kidney recovery by simply improving the hydration. So oftentimes I'll see a patient come in, they're on a, a diuretic medication. Uh, many of you know it's hydrochlorothiazide or HTC, uh, HCTZ. Uh, and uh, that's medication for blood pressure, but also uh, you know dehydrates you. Uh, they may be on uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And these things have an adverse effect on kidney function mm -hmm. in addition to the food they eat. So we make adjustments in the food, reduce the requirement for the medication, reduce those medications or change it to something that doesn't have a kidney failure effect. And we find the kidneys turn around uh, to a certain extent frequently just making those changes. Other mechanisms result in reducing inflammation in the kidney itself. Kidney is a vascular structure. Uh, so it's affected by the same you know, problems that the heart and brain's affected with. So natural plant-based diet will allow the vascular structure of the kidney to improve. So over time, you get kidney improvement there. Uh, obviously, reducing or eliminating animal protein, I should say eliminating animal protein is going to make a big difference as well. And you put less stress on the kidney. Great. You know what? There was a whole, I so apologize. We're, we're just new to, to streaming on Instagram this week and I can't see it from my screen. I have to move over. There was a bunch of questions there. So hopefully guys on Instagram, you'll go to help at chefaj.com and write your question in. And that's how we can keep it and save it and get back to you. This was so much fun, Dr. Montgomery. And if you want to show your food uh, classification system next month, and also we didn't really talk about like oil and alcohol, which some cardiologists, even a few plant-based ones are really big fans of. I'd love to get your take on that. No, I'd love to give that. And also those questions, I, I want to iterate. I mean, if they can share those questions, we can share them with me because also I would take those questions uh, and maybe do future shows with you based on some of those questions. So I'd, that would be great. You can always, guys, you can always get the questions in even before the guest is announced because he will be on every second Wednesday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And we are honored and thrilled and so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. My guest is Trisha Gray. She lost 70 pounds eating the way we all recommend. And...